Yes. Well, and also I think that we see the, uh, the excess of our, um, our system er, uh, in, you know, basically making sure, I don't have a problem with making sure that, uh, that we don't get infections and et cetera, et cetera, but we will go way overboard and waste a phenomenal, phenomenal amount of resources. So. Yeah, the other, the other thing that they do, which is really, uh, you know, really uh, beautiful, in, the, in one of the rooms where they have the four operating room tables, the th uh, fourth table is for training. So the three, uh, three, three super folks will be, or the uh, faculty will be doing their cases, and then one, one of them will rotate during one of their downtimes to the, um, the table with the resident or fellow on it. And so there's always teaching going on in all of the ORs at all the time, so it's, it's really fantastic. So, Randy, I just showed a, a couple slides of our trip to, or my trip to Pondicherry, and we were just discussing third world, a little bit of third world, the fact that they don't have any more infection, lower, even when they're doing these multiple cases. The other, th and I've been tracking my cases, just uh, myself and Alan Robin in Baltimore, just looking at what happens, and the average use of BSS per case in my setting is 60 cc's per case, which means that you are throwing 430 cc's of fluid away every time because we have to break down and start over. So just a few thoughts. Now, I was hoping we'd, I, there's just a couple things I want to talk about with, with dysphotopsia. So we're going to get a lot of that uh, pretty soon. So let's just go here. Randy, I was just saying this is a tr really uh, r random talk this morning, so absolutely nothing that goes on. So this is uh, this is an interesting problem. I think Randy's done probably more work, and Nick has done more work than almost anybody on this issue. Um, and I'm really, this is, a, this is a case of positive dysphotopsia, because I wanted to show it for a couple of reasons. But when you examine a patient who comes in with a complaint, with 2020 or 2015 vision, uh, they can, they'll describe these phenomenon and you'll look at the eye and you'll think it's perfect. And if you look at the eye and they give these complaints and you think it's posterior capsule clouding, please don't do it because it's n almost never. There's lots of causes for these uh, lens-induced causes and I'll show you one that is a lens-induced causes. But remember, you can get these kinds of phenomena from cel cylinder issues, capsular issues, but and that's the problem because, in fact, if everything looks perfect and there's a little PCO, the thought, if, if they're ditching a lot, the thought that they're going to uh, improve by PCO removal is not good. Make sure you get corneal uh, examination and CME. And Randy, this is, of course, the, one of the surveys that you, you do. And you might want to comment a little bit on positive dysphotopsy or... or so
No, was there, I think it was 96, wasn't it? Was what? Steve Hansen, that one? Yeah. Uh, no, no, this is, uh, this is uh, actually a paper that, that, that I did, and uh, I guess I coined the term that's not appropriate, but let, let's use digital yeah. proxy. Yeah. So, uh, and we have that a lot of work that's been done on this. Yeah. Uh, I think we're learning more and more as time goes on, but the, the key thing is, is that that paper that uh, Christian Kennard uh, put together that came out that was a part of the Bing Course lecture that I gave is that if you look at overall the number one complaint on uncomplicated cataract surgery that's a dissatisfier by far is digital proxy. By far. And uh, for those people who have it, and it's, a, it's actually a very common complaint, we were able to show that uh, even at two years out, you'll get 15% of patients that will still talk about some element of this. Uh, uh, but uh, overall, And so this is a this is a r real patient of mine sent down from by Rich Hoffman in Eugene, Oregon. And uh, one thing to notice: this was day one. So a lot of times they they come into your office, they want the lights out. They they're they're describing these phenomenon, and they're, they're, unfortunately you, they're, she was 20, 20 at that point, so they told her she was crazy, and she may have been, don't but. Do that. <laughs> but Please don't do that. Hence the reason why she's down here. But at any rate, uh, point being that uh, she, this, uh, she was sent down about six to seven months later, and she is a professor of statistics at the University of Oregon. But also notice what other things that are going on all this time. Just, she kept a pretty good look. I had to read this in the dark because the room was dark when I came in. 
And uh, usually the patients, they talk about, she actually had the PCO rate. A few other things she talked about were, you know, reactions during surgery. And then she did a nice analysis. She did a web search for us, <laughs> which was very nice. You see here positive dysphotopsia. She's quoting rates of 15 to 30 percent. And uh, th she just talks about her, what happened in her case. People tend to be OCD. I mean, there's no question. Oh, yeah. There is a, there is a personality difference. Yep. It, they, they are not crazy, which is real. Yeah, and unfortunately, some of the early papers on this are from our group. And uh, some of them how to handle it were from our group. So she flew down and we took care of her. Uh, and, you know, it's just very interesting to see that this kind of analysis. Uh, here's her evidence-based guideline that she sent to me, and which was nice, and <laughs> how to percentage of YAG patients. And, but these are her drawings. These are her drawings. And they were gone with the exchange of that lens. 30 seconds afterwards, she opened her eye and said, they're gone. Yeah, that's exactly what, what happened. And the other problem, too, is they, they thought her, a lot of it was uh, inflammation and tear films and things like that. So they treated her for way, way too long. Uh, I, you didn't see the pressure, but she was a steroid responder. She came in with pressures of 48 at the time because they were mishandling that. Uh, here's some more things that she drew, all these little images. So you do really have to listen to these p folks. Now, what I'm going to do here is I just want to show you know, one, ca one case where, where the reason for the dysphotopsy is fairly obvious. So for you, in, for in practice, if you see these kinds of scratches on the anterior surface of the lens and on the posterior surface of the lens, and this is a restore. So this person was told for seven years, or three years, excuse me, that she was crazy, everything was perfect. And then she was referred in. You guys got the, well actually, this is a case report. But I, I don't want to show the whole thing here. But she, and so one point is, even three to five years later, seven years is the longest I've, I've done, maybe eight years, you can get these lenses out and, not, and put a new lens in. Sometimes you, uh, if, if they're, uh, oh, some of the di plate lenses, they can be very difficult to remove. But you, what you have to do is just take your time open the bag, and you can see there's all a little bit of capsule phimosis as you're going on, and then I'm going to jump to the end. So you, there's, what I use is I use a viscocanalostomy cannula sometimes, because that's only 32, uh, uh, gauge 32 goes in very easily. Sometimes you lift up the capsule with a second instrument. So let here, this is another thing you use, so can you use. Down 38 Well, yeah, and this is, this, and this is the, uh, the uh, uh, old retro bubber because it's a little dull at the end. That goes in very nicely. So there's lots of different tricks. We can talk about that. But I just want to show the very end of this removal to get some idea. So just to show you what happens with, or can happen with these lenses, um, I, I already knew that I was going to put a CPR in, so I was willing to, to do a little bit more there. I'm, I'm showing what's, what the problem is. Everybody, it's easy to get this part out. But this whole um, part haptic, but most importantly, this little piece at the end, you've got to get that out. And don't ever pull to the center, rot counter rotate, just the opposite of what you're putting it into. And you can see here, this will give you an example of what's going to happen. So just watch that. Boom. And the same thing on the other side. You've got to get that out. Or it, you, uh, but the other thing you can do is you can also you want, uh, you can do, uh, you can leave the haptics in rather than, rather than take out the bag. And then the same thing occurred on the other side. And then we just, and by the way, I put a restore back in because her other eye was 20-20 and she loved the restore uh, and this one. So you, I did use the CTR to keep the angle separated, but you can see that it'll pop out. And Nick, you guys saw this, this case, as you know. The case report. Any comment on the? To the resident and say, what problem is that case? We all have a tendency to see if we see something on the table, we say, it would be all right. Uh, you know, there's, there's some lumps on the implant, there's something that's devoted. You put it in, it's going to be a tricky case. You go away, you've got five months of procedure, and you say, oh, oh it'll be all right. The implant is fine. It won't be all right. So the time it takes is on the table. So if you see it, you just 
stop what you're doing, you can take some additional extra to the bag, you have it wide open, you can pop it out, take it out, you can take it out, and still put it on the table for the patient to look at. And just see, now I understand what you're doing. You're thinking of the patient's done, the patient's done beautifully, and then you see that, oh, that's not going to solve this problem. Let's do all that other stuff. Don't, don't take that one. Let's put the one you have. And you won't have any problems with this one. Yeah. And, uh, by the way, when I, when I did do these cases, I do fold them in the eye and bring them out rather than cut them because almost all these were sent to me are legal cases and I wanted to, them to be able to analyze the, the eye well. Yeah? Well, the lens that was in was an uh, SN60WF, it's a wavefront lens, and so I just took it out and used an AQ uh, 5010? I think it was 2010, the large one. It's, uh, it's the star. It is the most forgiving we have available. It has the lowest refractive index, so it runs through it. Yeah. We've got some eventual things. It is a 6 century millimeter optic and uh, has a, a fully rounded edge, so it is the most forgiving lens we have. I have had some patients, even with that, that yeah. have a total windows. It's right. usually That's that's negative dyspotopsia. That's not that's not positive dyspotopsia. And that, I think if you, one of the things if you ask, I, I think it's almost 100%, if you ask them, will notice the, the, the bl blinder issue. Negative is vast yeah. majority yeah. of it. Yeah, and they, and they, use, they f frequently do go away or they neuroadapt because they really probably don't go away. And so you don't have to do this on a lot. But, it, it, but you know, resist the, resist the temptation to just pop the capsule, which is what a lot, it's a, you, normally what we do. Oh, this will this will get rid of it because it's not going to get rid of it. And yeah, it sounds like this will talk. It's not supposed to be a capsule. At least right. leave the capsule alone. Yeah. Uh, the 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 three month rule is a pretty good one, and that is is that if it's persisting at three months, you probably got a problem. But I, the, I and I don't I tell patients essentially gone all the time, and you want it positive encouraging. You have to do a little care. It's it's essentially gone by three months or three and a half. And uh, I've even patients. I use I use the yeah. you get out by then you're at least six months out. If it's persisting then you gotta do it. Yeah, so I and I use the three month as well. 
But, the, but the, one of the points that Randy brought up, and it's really important when you're talking to your patients, is acknowledge their problem as real. Don't, you know, don't think that they're crazy. You know, 2020, I, I can't see. You know, our natural inclination is, yeah, you can probably see okay, but you gotta acknowledge that they may have some problems. So just a next little topic, uh, which is stimulated a lot, is, uh, w you know, what am I doing differently this year than, say, three years ago? Uh, so this is true. This was a talk I gave at the Academy last year uh, on uh, pseudo-exfoliation. Um, can an old dog learn new tricks? But the other question is, do we need new tricks? You know, when you're, when you're trying to analyze things that you're gonna put into your armamentarium, you go see something that looks pretty cool, you know, sometimes it's worth integrating into your system and sometimes not. So this is a really true point uh, uh, issue. So uh, why worry? I've been talking pseudo-exfoliation, of course. Capsule rectus issues, pupil dilation problems, zonular problems, sticky cortex, capsule phimosis, late subluxation. So otherwise, no issues, right? <laughs> Routine run of the day. So, and one of the questions that we, ha we haven't answered, but we're trying to get a handle on is, what do we do here, or what can we do, if anything here, to see if we can decrease that rate or make it at, e at least till we retire and somebody else has to deal with it? <laughs> so, so we want, uh, I think the issue is, one, always assess the patient pre-op if you can, look for pupil dilation, make sure, because you gotta have a game plan ready, minimize the zonular stress, and then do what I like to call elegant, surgery as much as you can. This is a, was an interesting pay case that also, uh, just to show you th things are random, it was 12 years post-op. This happened in August, it's, it's in, that's also a case report in the journal. Patient came in for his routine yearly examination, dilated, looked at him, perfect, no, didn't see any pseudo fake, nothing. Called me later on in the afternoon, said, my vision's blurry. I said, you're still dilated if it's blurry the next day, come in. Came in, he had bilateral, simultaneous, anterior subluxation of the IOL, which I, I did take him to the OR and fix it that day. But, you know, so <laughs> these things can happen. So he, what he did was, he, uh, he was dilated, and he started working in his garden in the afternoon, and when his pupil came down, he trapped both lenses. And he, there, or Could be. No, well, I didn't tell him not to bend down. I think he didn't tell me not to play basketball, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> you have to add that to your list. <laughs> I, I had to add. Yeah, I, I called the first year resident, they wouldn't do it, I don't know why, but I, was, I wanted to go keep it down in the lower part of the system. <laughs> so this is an important question, I think, and, and I think it does, it, some of these have changed what we're doing, and some, so there's beautiful work that came out of Nick and Liliana's in the work here, uh, um, Brian Zog, as you can see this, just beautiful displays. Point is, pseudo, uh, you can see these with, with the CTRs, the, the, temp, the potential advantage of CTR is it makes refixation a little bit easier. But if you want that lens out, it also makes it harder. So sometimes what I'll do if I have to take that out is, is bring it out separately. And you can often just put a, uh, uh, some kind of a 10 hole pro, uh, nylon suture through one of the eyelets so that it won't be lost when you bring it up. And then you can open it up and then you can often you can bring it out. And that way you don't have to go through a, as large of an incision. So. And so what are the different things that, we're do that I'm doing now that I, I certainly, uh, I frequently viscodissect in these cases to, to help allow the rotational mo mo movements. Some work done here by the uh, Abe Vasavada's daughters when she, they were here is that they showed with Miyake views that the uh, visco does get back there. I usually use uh, one that's gonna be retentive so I'll often use a viscoat. But you can use, I don't, I don't really care what you use but so don't, if the, if, the, if the lens doesn't rotate easily, one, don't do it. And you could rehydrodissect, you can viscodissect, but again, make sure that you don't rotate if there's any, any stress on the, on the zonule. Comment, Ruth?
with that, then you know that you've got to be very, very careful. And I don't know how I've commented several times. You've seen videos up on the screen. And uh, they put us CPR and they finish the patient. Everything was fine. And we both sit and look at each other and said, yes. That's it's gone. a matter of months to a year to when that, that whole thing can dissipate. You yeah. can tell there's maybe a few communes left that's holding on. Right. So I do like, in those cases, I do bimanual rotations. It can really reduce the zonular stress and you make sure for the residents you do not push down because that, that the uh, peripheral part of the bag will seal around the, the uh, nuclear tissue and then as you try to rotate you'll pop zonules. The other thing I'm doing routinely and expressly in uh, cervical exfoliation cases is to reduce anterior lens epithelial cells by uh, using sweeps and we're working on some newer sweeps and some newer ways to do this. It does not reduce PCO but in a Fairly good study by Ori Halio and Oliver Findel. It does reduce capsule phimosis. So again, if this is something you could do easily at the time, the extra 30, 40 seconds I think is worth it. And then if you're using CTRs, I really like the new one, the injectable one. It comes, uh, it's very easy. It comes in an L and an R, left and right. And of course, everybody thinks the L is for the left eye and the R is for the right eye, and that's not the case. It's how it comes out of this. And just for the residents, what you want to do, if it's a generalized zonulopathy, which most PXC is, it doesn't matter which way you go. If it's a, if it's a trauma case, then you want to use the good zonules, so you aim it towards the weak zonules to get it in rotation. If you go the other way, you can end up stripping more zonules if you uh, put too much force on the other direction. Comment, Ren? So this is a case, these are Miyake views. We were looking at this to do, we were looking at the whether what the ultra chopper does, which is very good. But I wanted you to, so this was when I started to think of, started thinking again about uh, rotation. Look at that up here. Let me just rerun that one more time. So we were not looking, we weren't even looking at this, but look at the, look at the stress on the zonules. So rotation is not benign. You got to do it as elegantly as you can, and uh, make sure it's pretty free. If it, if it doesn't start to rotate, don't do it. Do, do you think Alan, this for dissection slightly increases the risk of a posterior capsular blowout? Uh, if it, it, yeah, you, I do. What I do is I have to. Re, I reduce flows. I reduce all sorts of things when I'm doing this. The other thing uh, that I do now, you say, well, I, I remember teaching courses on small phaco. We could do it through a one or two millimeter pupil. And, that, and I look at my own videos at that time, and I still have some from the late 80s and early 90s, and I say, what an idiot. Because even though that, that was not a very big, uh, that wasn't a, it was, the pupil was a good size, in pseudo X, I think you gotta get it bigger. You don't wanna leave cortex. You don't want to do it, anything serious. So, so I think. And you don't want to leave it a small capsule, right? Right, exactly. So you want to. So even though I didn't, I could have easily done it through that. I decided I try not to. And the other thing is, if the bag is even in the slightest bit floppy, don't come out of the eye without filling the bag, even just a little bit, so the bag will not come up because they'll keep coming up and keep coming up. And then remember, on the last part of your of your. Uh, the nuclear disassembly, I usually drop the flow rate uh, down to about 25 so things don't happen quickly. Again, to try to reduce that. And then this is the CTR pulling up. So the other thing that, I, we, that we used to teach is radial stripping. So this is another beautiful display that Lilian and, uh, and Nick and the guys from uh, Argentina or Brazil Look at the, if you look at this, that thing again, I want you to, I'm gonna start that over. Not this one, no, that, okay. I want you to look right up here. So they, there's only cortex, there's no bag. And look at the, look at the pull on the zonules. Then and look at the end as you go down. There's almost no uh, forces being put on the peripheral part of the zonule. And you can't always do that, but you, you, you really should try to do that. 
And so you see here, this is the reverse view. This is a tangential. And so what are we doing differently? We're not stripping to the center. And number one, it's safer, but number two, it's faster. It's way faster once you get the technique done. You can often go around in one or two moves, and so it reduces that time, but more importantly, it also reduces the zonular stress. So these are just some cases, uh, a few cases that I do. The other thing I'm doing differently, too, a little bit, is my rexus, and I'll show you one of that in a minute. So you can see here, and these are uh, just going ra randomly around, and you can see it just, it's gone. I mean, that that's happens all the time. So the difference that I'm doing on these, for a second. So I, again, there are two types of, of, of rexus. One is a standard tear rexus where you fold over and lead it, and you're using the zonules on that force to just to tear around, and you re-grab and re-grab and re-grab. And uh, let's see, he's a, he's a first year resident. Well, everybody knows the little maneuver, correct? So what is, what is the purpose of the little, Brian Little's maneuver? Huh? It's a rescue, yeah. So what, what you do is you, you see that, the, that it's going out, so you, you stop, you fold, you fold it, refold it, grab it, and pull it to the center, right? So why not try to incorporate that in an infinite number of times by tearing centrally all the way around? And it sort of gets free, it's freaky the first couple hundred that you do, but it's going to be, it's worth it. <laughs> so if you watch, what you can do is, now this, this won't be a perfect one, N none of them are, by the way, obviously, but if you pull to the center, you can usually do most of these cases in three grabs. The trick is don't grab it close, start it in the direction you want it, and then just pull to the center. It goes all the way around, and so I, I reduce the amount of time doing the rexus, but also, because you're doing an infinite number of, of Brian Little maneuvers, they don't tear out very often. Nick, you want to comment? He's a professional. Okay. Why do it on everybody? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So then the other thing is, one of the things that's happened is we, our microscopes have got so much better that we, we realize all the crap that we leave in the eye. So we decided we, maybe we should really remove some of these lens epithelial cells. And we're trying to design better ones. These, these singer sweeps work pretty well, but there's often a little stria on the capsule be, or on the, uh, the bag, not the bag, but the wound because of the way they're designed. So we're trying to redesign them so that, that you can really see them. This is with, with one of the new Zeiss scopes. You can really see beautifully. You can go all the way around. Uh, I'm not as anal as uh, Sam Masket, but he puts two extra stab incisions in, so he can do 360 on every single case. So it's kind of interesting. So the other, I'm not going to discuss that, but I wanted to show one more thing. So Alan, can I ask you just one question? And, and sure. Nick as well. Is that there was a paper from the DMV group in which they compared the uh, Technus and Nasikov single sweeps in regards to PTO long term, and they didn't find a PTO difference, but they found a big HTO difference, and they found that the, uh, there was much less anterior capsular passages and contraction in association with Technus. What, what did you think of that? Which is true to your work? It's the best I've seen on the subject. You know, it's interesting because the group followed the patients really diligently, and they did some kind of dilated pictures and, and looked They're at their very the very and they're probably the best in the world. Yeah, very dynamic, they can do. And so, but the, um, you know, the interesting thing there was that these, they didn't find any difference in PTO issues with the shorter advantage of having the uh, pointer lens or the inner teaching to be posterior sharp edging. There's no difference in PTO, but it's interesting that PTO was interesting because my PTO yeah, yeah. usually is affected by
Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. I, I, yeah. Are yeah. you spending more to protect this now in regards to sort of spoliation and things like that? I mean, I'm, I'm looking more to ice. I, I, one thing about that I like about the SN lens is it's so floppy. It's so much easier to get in uh, to these cases. So I, I, if I'm really worried about drawing those, either I'll use a three piece or I'll use that just because of that. Just it's just so tacky, and it really it's just floppy as all get out. So one more thing I want everybody to know about. I don't know if you you all know this, but you know we're uh, we're talking about CTRs, which you saw. We know that the Sioni modification of the CTR is a single eyelet or double eyelet that comes up over the bag. An Ahmed uh, segment or a capture tension segment is about a 90 degree that's PMMA and it has a single eyelet. We I use that a lot in cases, uh, trauma cases where you don't need, you know, put, it, put, put the Sioni rings in. By the way, if you're using the Sioni, use the new G1. Don't use the old one. It's a much softer, much easier to put in. And now there's a modifica another modification that actually comes from here, so I want to show it to you. This is the um, body. Let's see if I can get that open. I don't want to just, yeah, let's do that. Sorry about this. I told you it was going to be random. So this is a kid. The second eye of a kid, I'm, what I'm doing is doing uh, Sioni's on the other eye and then uh, uh, looking at the embodies on the, this eye. So basically, as you'll see here, I, you won't, uh, let me bring that up. So this is, it's quite a bit different because it is, um, it's very floppy. So it has, it has, it's, at first I thought, well, this isn't going to work. So, so, so what I've done is these are, this is obviously uh, Gore-Tex. These are, in these kids I go about two and a half uh, millimeters posterior. And then I use uh, MVR, 23 or 25 gauge MVR blades to, to, to make the, uh, these incisions and then you put uh, Gore-Tex in. And so uh, Bala's thing ha is two loops. And the, uh, so I've separated these by about four, sometimes five millimeters and uh, goes through that eyelet and through that eyelet. And there it's a, a li you'll see it's a little bit floppy putting it in. And, they, and it, it isn't elevated. So the first time you use them, it's a little, it, you think you're, you're expecting to do it like a Siona or an Ahmed segment, but you, it just pulls up very nicely. And uh, this eye is uh, uh, beautifully centered. The other one, and this actually had a, a very, very dislocated, that you couldn't see the lens in the pupil. He tried to really bring that uh, down to do the, do the rexus on these cases. So it's really, um, uh, I think it's gonna be a very interesting modification. And we have them here, so if anybody wants to try them, just let, let Bala know. I think they, I, I don't know if they're actually carrying it yet in the thing, but we, we have them here. So I, I just think this is, uh, for, for, it, 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 for some of these cases, it'll be quite good. So this is the, uh, what they look like at, sort of at the end of the procedure. It's very beautifully centered and, and the, the, the distribution of the energy is really, the, the, there's no pulling on the rexus or anything. It's a very, very nice idea. So just uh, food for a little thought on some of your, some of these types of cases. So if you get lenses where you really uh, have a 180 to uh, zone you. I, I did put a CTR in obviously because there sometimes even in, in these Marfan's kids, this, this kid's a 10, um, you just want to make sure that you have potential for putting other devices in. So uh, with that, I think I'll stop and a a let everybody go. I have one more thing we'll talk about next time, which will be sort of reposition of intraocular lenses. And that's a long talk, so any questions? Nick? And it's interesting how, yeah. how common pure exfoliation is because of those type of dislocations. And Juliana and I have gotten a lot of lenses from Germany, you know, you know, a, a very good center of German Vega surgeon, done complicated surgery, and these lenses continuously dislocating. And when we look at them, it's interesting that this has got a clinical history of exfoliation about a third of the time. And when we actually look at the caps of the bag, microscopically, two-thirds of them have a mm -hmm. dislocation. Well, yeah, 
she does. No, she's not. I love that when you, when you put that in yeah. there. I, I mean, it's, the, the diagnosis on the really super obvious case can be made, but there's plenty of subtle there's stuff. Really on oh, yeah. What? You know, when everything mm -hmm. comes in with the news and all these things, exfoliation, but we still don't have any good evidence for that for a long term. So I think it's a big thing. And don't be telling me, don't, you know, the test is only as more during surgery. You don't make a small capsule on you. If you start to see the capsule rises, you give it a few contracts. You will see in about three to seven days it enters that cell line. You'll see shit yeah. enter that cell line. Yeah. Classic case where I'm at is when yeah. I'm yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. 20 years ago, yeah. The the, uh, the, uh, the other point with the with those lenses is there's no really good Sulcus lens in the United States. Uh, the best would be the Star, and it's their their optic is bigger, and it's kind of hard to get those into the bag. The the MA sixties are really you know you look at the size of those. You can do a fifty, which which would get you out there, but you'd have to carry a lot of of MA fifties to get a big size because that's a six and a half millimeter optic. And I think a 13 and a half millimeter things, but the but these the, the, the hope is you're those the, the, they're going to be in the angle or in the sulcus and have fi uh, you know fiber around it or whatever holds it in there, but they it's just not designed for. Designed for the bag. Designed for the bag. Yeah, yeah. They they I've seen some decentered ones on those sent to me for. I will change on those because they've, they've captured it in the bag, and then as the bag starts to move, the whole lens starts to move, too. So uh, the point, of, point is uh, old dogs can learn new tricks and some of them are worth putting into your armamentarium.